Good morning. morning. It's great to be with you on a Pentecost Sunday. We celebrate, as we've been hearing in worship, the awesome service of the men and women who have defended our country. I echo the thanks that was already expressed to you who have served us in that way, and we appreciate each one of you. But today, as God's people, we also celebrate the Holy Spirit and what a gift God has given us in the Holy Spirit, the third member of the Trinity. You know, uh, in the Old Testament time, the Holy Spirit anointed key leaders for a designated period of time for a specific role of leadership in the course of God's history with his people. So prophets, priests, and kings would receive the Holy Spirit. But now, in the celebration of what Jesus promised would happen after he ascended into heaven, he told them to gather and wait for the gift of the Spirit. And then he said, the power of God is going to come on you. Now we talk about the Spirit as power, but really I want you to think about it as a person. As a person who comes to us. And binds us together as God's people, but also fills us with his presence in a way that is intended to anoint you as the people of God to be kingdom builders. I don't know if you think about yourself that way ever. Wake up in the morning and think to yourself, I'm a kingdom builder. But that's what you are. You are a follower of Jesus Christ. You are filled with the Holy Spirit. You are anointed with power to be a builder of the kingdom of God. I don't know if any of you have ever experienced in life a moment where you're thinking to yourself, I wish I had more power. Maybe you farmers, you know, your tractor's uh, lugging down and you need a little more power. We can think about how many of you have ever loved watching drag racers okay both of you thank you (laughs) but isn't it true that a racer can an engine have too much power you know it's kind of like tim the tool man taylor more power get it going but power is not always life-giving or productive power can also be destructive we think about when the world war ii was ended with the atom bomb and how the struggle of leaders was morally deliberating whether to do that and did it spare more lives in the long run for the bombing that was done. But I also think about, I love sports. Many of you do too. So I think about a manager who wants a power hitter in his lineup to be productive in uh, the producing of runs. Or, you farmers again, When you pull into the field and it's harvest time, you want a combine that's got the power to do the job, right? A power to bring in the crop. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. That's a promise. It's a declaration. You will receive power when God's Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses, it says in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So the whole of what we celebrate this morning in the giving of God of His Holy Spirit, in the birth of the church, the people of God who are the body of Christ, He fills us with His Spirit so that we can build His kingdom. Let's talk a little bit about how that power works in us. It said in the account that David read for us from Acts chapter 2 that the Spirit was released and it was like the sound of a rushing wind. I remember when I was a fourth grade boy in Belmont, Iowa, and a tornado destroyed the town. And we were in the school, and you could just hear the howl of the wind in its power. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know, human beings have spent a lifetime figuring out ways to harness the power of the wind for productive purposes for us. So even in our 21st century, you drive the countryside and you see those turbines that are turning in the wind 
to utilize the power of the wind and convert it to the power of electricity. And we use it in our utilities and for our purposes as people in this world. But from a century ago, we remember those majestic sailing vessels. Maybe some of you still like to go to the lake and sail on the water. And what do you do in order to motor across the water? Wrong, wrong term, actually. What do you do to propel across the water? You raise the sail. So when we think about the gift of the Holy Spirit, really the key for us is to think about how do I harness the power of the Spirit so that God's power working in my life can use me for the purposes of what God wants to do through me. How does that happen? And maybe the key is like the turban or the sailing ship. You need to simply receive what God is eager to give. That there needs to be somewhere in your faith consciousness a prayer that is prayed where you say, Lord God, I receive gladly what your Spirit wants to give me. Empower my life so that my life is used for your purposes in your kingdom. I encourage you to pray that prayer. Come Holy Spirit, you who have been to Via Cristo, you remember this prayer? Come, Holy Spirit, stir the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your love. That's said before every message that's given in that Via Cristo renewal weekend. It's a beautiful prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, stir the hearts of your faithful and kindle within our hearts the fire of your love. If you and I prayed that prayer every morning, it raises in even a Norwegian brain consciousness the presence of God's Spirit and a receptivity to the Spirit's working and an awareness that my life is to be propelled in kingdom-building work. There's a beautiful passage in the book of Ephesians, the first chapter, I want you to listen to the language as Paul writes. He says, I've prayed to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he may give you the Spirit, a Spirit that would give you wisdom and revelation so you would know God better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, that you may know the hope to which he's called you and the riches of the inheritance of all the saints. But then listen, according to his incomparable great power toward we who believe, the power that is working according to God's mighty strength who raised Jesus from the dead. Wow, that's a prayer, right? And if you read it in the original language, it's like it uses three different terms to talk about power or strength. And one of them we know the best is dynamite. It's the Greek word dunamos. It's like an explosive power that makes happen what I could never happen in my own will or my own effort or my own ability. I'm inviting the supernatural power of Almighty God to be at work in my life so that I can be used for the purposes that God desires. There is within that prayer, you see, a daily surrender to something greater than myself. Now when the Spirit comes, one of the things that the Spirit wants to do is to heal our inner heart. Many of us, prior to our faith coming alive in Jesus Christ, have journeyed in such a way that our souls, our spirits, are wounded and broken, and hurting, sometimes by Lavig's own foolishness, and sometimes by the way other people have imposed themselves on us. We've been wounded, we've been hurt, we've been broken, and our whole vision of life is skewed because of it. And we pray for the Holy Spirit to heal the woundedness in my emotions so that I can function in life in a balanced and healthy way emotionally. 
Many of you deal with that kind of background. But you can pray that the Holy Spirit would heal your inner heart. But the other work of the Holy Spirit, as you read it from Acts 2, as David read it for us, notice that in the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, there was a miracle in the speaking. They spoke in languages they had never learned, but there was a second miracle, the miracle in the hearing. They heard the message of God and the great things that God has done. So one of the primary things that the Holy Spirit wants to do in every heart is to create faith in us to trust the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the work of the kingdom. And my bondage of the will, Luther says, blinds me and my self-centered rebellion resists So the Spirit has to awaken me to my sinfulness, my need for Jesus, and then create within me the capacity to trust the promise of an invisible God who has given me His Son, Jesus Christ. It's the glory of the gift of faith. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Our work then as people of the kingdom, filled with the Holy Spirit, is to be kingdom builders. But we can't bring people into the kingdom unless we ourselves know the king. So I invite you again this morning to reaffirm your allegiance to the king. And say, Lord Jesus, you are my king. And I want my life to bless others to be a kingdom builder. What happens then is that the Holy Spirit comes into your life to empower your unique personality. No one just like you. You are a unique creation of the living God, the master artist, and the Holy Spirit has come into you. That's why in Genesis chapter 2, it says that God created Adam and then Eve, and it says he breathed in them. And they became a living being. There is this intimacy and also this interdependency of my life in relation to God. So when the Spirit comes into me, that which is contradictory to the purposes of God is put to death. You know what that stuff is in your heart? You know the stuff that when you're aware of God stirring in you, God shows you the garbage, the dirt, the impurity that needs the cleansing of Jesus' love and grace. And then, glory to God, the Spirit puts to death in me my sinfulness so that Jesus Christ's Spirit is raised up in me and in you. And the Spirit then uses the uniqueness of your personality, the gifts and the abilities and the passions that are uniquely yours for the purposes of blessing God's people and building the kingdom. I was in northern Minnesota this Monday through Wednesday opening the family cabin up close to Bemidji. I won't bore you with the story of how I froze putting in the dock again this week. (laughs) But there was a convenience store just off the dirt road that leads to our cabin, a convenience gas station that sat there idle for a couple of years. The, The convenience store was running down. It looked like abandoned property. But this spring, there was a huge banner. It said, new owners under new management. It was painted. It was cleaned up. It was fixed up. It was ready for business. When you and I in our prayer life say, come Holy Spirit, stir the hearts of your faithful and kindle in us the fire of your love, guess what? It's a way of saying, I'm under new management. Who's the manager? the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has come to work in you and me and manifest himself through the personalities that God has given us to build his kingdom. I'm one of those that's been enrolled in the Dave Ramsey Financial Peace 
class on Wednesdays. It's a powerful class. I hope eventually all of you can take this course too. If you're a member of faith and want to be a part of it, it'll be offered again this fall. But one of the illustrations that he tells of the power to have your life transformed, of course, he's talking in the area of finance and giving, but he uses the analogy of a Belgian horse. Beautiful, majestic animal. I know some of you have horses, love horses. He says that our lives, connecting to Matthew 11, our lives are yoked to Jesus Christ. Do you know that a Belgian horse, a single Belgian horse, can pull 8,000 pounds? But you know what happens if one Belgian horse is yoked to another Belgian horse, how many pounds they can pull? 24,000 pounds. They're yoked together. And if they're trained, that yoke team can pull 32,000 pounds. When you say, come Holy Spirit, and you say, come Lord Jesus, Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. When my life, your life, is by faith yoked to Jesus Christ, then the power of the presence of the living God does awesome things through you and in you. Things that you couldn't do except that Jesus' Spirit helps you to do them. We are anointed with the Spirit's presence and power in order that you and I would be builders of God's kingdom in the name of Jesus. We got work to do, right? So I grew up in a generation, my dad the preacher, where being a part of the church was largely a spectator sport. You know what I mean? The preacher was hired to do the ministry. And everybody came once a week to say, boy, his sermon was a little long, but boy, That's not the vision of Pentecost. The vision of Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit is poured into all believers so that you are anointed to do the work of God's kingdom. So how do we build the kingdom? Well, it's as simple as preaching Jesus Christ crucified and risen. And God's Spirit, remember, a miracle of not only speaking but of hearing, God's Spirit will stir faith in the hearts of people when you and I dare to share in our own words and way that I've come to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. He's my friend, but He's also my Lord and my God. We build the kingdom when we worship. We heard the verse earlier that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is to be an expression of the worship of God. But when we gather in this place and we hear the Word of God and we sing the praise that God deserves to hear, it rekindles our faith. It stokes us back up and we remember who we are and whose we are and why we live and what our purpose in life is. And we leave this place saying, I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to love people in Jesus' name. That's my work. But also, building the kingdom is our vocation. Ruby, our granddaughter, Denise, my granddaughter, five years old, she graduated from preschool this week. Do you know that um, they had a little segment in the preschool graduation where they said what each child wanted to be when they grow up. And every child, it was like a teacher, a carpenter, a doctor. It came to Ruby, you know what she had said? A unicorn. (laughs) And everybody started to laugh. And Ruby turns to her mom, my daughter, and says, Mommy, why is everybody laughing? She said, well, honey, a unicorn is make-believe. And Ruby says, ah, shoot. (laughs) I meant to say mermaid. (laughs) Do you know that you build the kingdom by the Holy Spirit within you in your daily life rhythms, in the circles of relationship that are yours? So in the work that you do, 
filled with God's Spirit, doing it the best you can to glorify God, you're building the kingdom of God. I just this Friday went to a funeral service for the Reverend Homer Larson, longtime pastor at Nazareth Lutheran in Cedar Falls, Iowa, but also over 50 years the radio preacher of Christian Crusaders Radio. And as a, at the funeral, they talked, of course, about the magnitude of his preaching ministry. But you know what stirred me the most? was when his son, John Larson, who was a lawyer in Cedar Falls, got up and said, one of the things I will always remember my, my father is that after my mother Eunice had a debilitating stroke in her late 60s, that for 18 years, our dad, Homer, attended to her and loved her, even though physically she was greatly limited and debilitated. He was faithful as a husband to our mother. And John said, that said something to us about the integrity and authenticity of our father's faith. But it also said something to us about how you live as a servant of God. That's your vocation, you see. Your vocation in your family, in your marriage, in parenting your children, in grandparenting your children, in being a committed friend, in giving yourself. You're building the kingdom because you're being faithful to Jesus Christ by being faithful in your relationships. God needs you to build his kingdom in what you do. We build the kingdom by sharing what we believe about Jesus. I already said that. All of us who do believe in Jesus should find a way in our own words and way to tell someone else why we've come to value him as our Savior and our God and be able to share it with others. And you just might say to yourself, well, I, I don't have that. I, 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 I can't do that. It's like... You're anointed with the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be my witnesses. Pray for the opportunity to tell someone else that you love Jesus. And let the Spirit do what the Spirit will. We're to teach the next generation. Pass on the faith. We're to encourage each other relationally. We're to serve others in love. There's nothing beneath my dignity, nothing beneath your dignity if we're kingdom builders. Nothing's beneath me. If Jesus were here, we'd fall all over ourselves to come and take care of him or serve him or wash his feet, right? But when God brings needy people into our lives, we balk at the opportunity to serve. But you see, we're kingdom builders. We're filled with the Spirit. And that's what God calls you to do, is to serve in love. And we're to be intercessors, praying for one another, praying for that healing, praying for the healing of our inner spirit, praying for the gift of faith, praying for physical healing. And we believe in the power of prayer because we're inviting the Almighty to touch people's lives. We're also to be stars shining in a dark, hopeless culture. Do you know that polls say that the members of America between the ages of 15 and 30 don't believe that we're going to have a future? That the largest percentage of those people don't believe that there is a future for our world because of war or because of the way the world is because of the meaninglessness of accumulation of things or because they've questioned whether there is a God or maybe it's the hypocrisy of we who name the name of Jesus. Whatever the full gamut of the reasons, how many people do you and I meet every day that are cynical and depressed and discouraged and believe they have no future? And they have no purpose in life. And our calling is to be lights of hope. 
the God is at work and that God loves all of us in the world. I just heard a story shared by David Jeremiah, a radio preacher. He was actually quoting from Eugene Peterson's book, Run With the Horses. And he was talking about a swallow, a mama swallow, sitting on a branch with three young, a dead branch four feet over the water. And the mama was deliberately, one at a time, pushing her babies off the end of the dead branch. And at some point between the branch and the water, the swallow found his wings and flew off. Well, the third swallow was the most tenacious, not to be bullied by mama, not to be pushed around, not to be pushed off the branch. And the mama pushed it until the baby kind of swung down, but with his talons gripping that dead branch for all it, all it could do. And then the mama began to peck at the talon of the foot. Moms, do you ever feel like you're pushing your kids out like that? But the mother knew that though their feet could walk and though talons could grip the branch, that the ultimate destiny of the bird was to find its wings and fly. When you and I not only profess faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins and the hope of heaven when we die, but when you and I rejoice and pray, come Holy Spirit, then we can soar to become all that God intended for us to be. That you and I, in the uniqueness of each of our personalities and gifts and passions, would be used by God's Spirit to build his kingdom one life at a time.